the United Kingdom history of the country that although today has a gradually fading tale of light. It should be noted that in the history of freedom of movement and grace not common for heavy aircraft of the time. It should be noted that although this case has been made public, the photos of the alleged flying object have never been released, and this is certainly a detail that deepens the mystery. During the 1950s, as public interest in UFOs increased, the British government launched Project UFO, later known as Project Condine from 1996 to 2000, to investigate sightings of unidentified flying objects and gather information. Only in 2006, the information gathered in these decades was disclosed through the publication of a report entitled Unidentified Aerial Phenomena in the UK Air Defence Region. During this period, a number of sightings were recorded across the country, including the famous observation by a pilot named James Howard, who claimed in 1954 that he saw a flying saucer over Scotland. As happened with the sighting over the English Channel, he also reports having noticed a silvery object with a triangular shape, this time that would have accompanied his military transport plane for a few miles, flying very close, and then, without making a sound, eating in a northerly direction and disappearing completely. In the early hours of the morning, radars at Lakenheath picked up another signal about 40 kilometers southwest of Bentwaters, which moved in a northwesterly direction and then stopped. The signal was the only one detected by the radars of both bases. The intervention of other aircraft was requested, but this signal too quickly disappeared, and from that moment on, there were no others. From the 50s, which was a very difficult period for British citizens, gripped by the pains of a huge post-war economic crisis, we move on to the 60s, a period of change and fervour that would lead to the genesis of a new nation capable of exporting its arts and culture, from music to film, all over the world. But in this climate of renewal in the cities, the countryside remained anchored to those traditional rights and values, and it is right here, in the small villages, where stories came to light that still fascinate enthusiasts of mysteries. The Warminster Thing One of the best-known sightings of the 1960s Stick Berwyn Mountains, way back in 1974, an event took place that still fascinates UFO enthusiasts that same night. It was hypothesized that the bright light and the roar could be explained by a seismic phenomena, such as a kind of seismic flash about the secrets of the cosmos. The base, according to the theory, also had connections to other
but found no conclusive evidence of the flying object or as the man never came home again. On June the 9th, his body was found atop a 10-foot pile of coal in the town of Todd Morden, 20 miles from his home. Sent to investigate, local policeman Alan Godfrey examined the body. His face was frozen in an expression of pure terror. Adamski was wearing a suit, but his shirt, wallet and watch were all missing. Adamski's hair had been cut in a way that Godfrey described as roughly cut. The young policeman also reported that Adamski had mysterious burns on his neck, head and shoulders, which is by far the most disturbing feature of this mysterious case. The coroner, James Turnbull, confirmed that some of the burns had been treated with a strange ointment, which could not be identified by forensic scientists. Speaking to reporters, Godfrey said there was a possibility Adamski had been abducted by aliens. I'm open-minded, I can't rule it out, were his words. The true cause of this poor miner's death remains a mystery to this day. The most absurd and improbable theories were pinned to this news story. Some claimed that Adamski had been killed by KGB agents, others that he had been struck by ball lightning, and still others that he owed a debt to someone to be avoided. For most mystery lovers, however, there was only one explanation. Adamski had encountered aliens and it had cost him his life. Five months after the gruesome discovery of Adamski's body, the small town of Todd Morden once again found itself at the centre of media attention. In the centre of events, we again find Officer Godfrey, who apparently, after the Adamski case, became of particular interest to extraterrestrial entities. Sent at five in the morning to take care of escaped cattle, Godfrey, according to his own account, was in his car and was crossing a country road when the car stopped suddenly and a beam of very powerful light appeared before his eyes. Godfrey described it as a brilliant light in the sky, a diamond-shaped rotating vessel, five metres high and 15 metres wide. Godfrey made a quick sketch of the object in his picked up his police radio to report the incident, but the line was dead. Finally, without making any noise, the object disappeared in a bright flash, and Godfrey found himself sitting in his car 30 yards further up the road. Looking at his watch, the policeman was surprised, because although the close encounter lasted no more than 60 seconds, 25 minutes had passed. Then he noticed an even more relevant detail, a strange burn mark that had appeared on his left leg. Godfrey was surprised, and when he returned to where he had seen the light, he found that the road the car was on was completely dry, even though it had rained recently. After recounting the experience, Godfrey was met with scepticism and was even ridiculed in his own community, and so on the advice of a lawyer friend, he decided to consult a hypnotist to find out the truth about what he had seen. Through hypnosis, Godfrey recalled being blinded by the light and passing out. He told the hypnotist that he woke up in a strange room where he was being examined by several small creatures and a tall, bearded humanoid figure resembling a Nordic alien. Again, his claims were frowned upon and ridiculed. A few weeks after Godfrey's report had hit the newspapers and made international headlines, he was summoned to the Inspector General's office. There sat a man in a black suit and tie, who introduced himself as a man from the Ministry. He had a folder containing strange vehicles designed by Godfrey. Godfrey was not allowed to see the rest of the file, but he believed it contained an account of that night's events and the mysterious death of Sigmund Adamski. The man forced Godfrey to stop talking about the close encounter, which Godfrey, very reluctantly, agreed to do. The young police officer met this man several times in the following days in Todd Morden, and finally realising that he was being spied on, 
decided to confront him one evening in a local pub, asking him to leave and never to return. After that meeting, the ministry man disappeared and was never seen again. Godfrey still firmly believes that he was a secret agent of MI5, sent from London to take care of the case. But another theory, circulating in recent years and much supported by sceptics, would concern the fact that the stranger was actually an employee of the West Yorkshire Police, who warned Godfrey not to speak to the press to avoid drawing more attention to the police themselves. It was later revealed that several other police officers and a bus driver had seen strange lights that morning, but it was decided at the station to cover it up so as not to embarrass the police. Following the events, Godfrey was transferred, but never stopped talking about his close encounter. On the night of December the 26th, 1980, a soldier at Woodbridge Air Force Base, on patrol, saw a particularly bright red light that appeared to come from nearby Rendlesham Forest. The soldier contacted the base's control tower, who replied that no flights were in progress from either Woodbridge or the nearby Bentwaters base. It was decided to send a three-man patrol to ascertain the origin of the mysterious light. The patrol consisted of Sergeant James Penniston and Airman John Burrows and Edward Cabinsag. The three men came to a clearing, in the centre of which they reported seeing a series of strange lights, three of which included a very powerful yellow light and two smaller red and blue ones. According to the official report, Sergeant Penniston, approaching, discovered that the lights were emitted by a metal object in the shape of a pyramid, which seemed to rest on a kind of tripod. Suddenly, the object rose into the air for about a metre, started to move horizontally towards the forest with a zigzag trajectory and then took off vertically and disappeared into thin air. A site survey conducted in daylight revealed three traces on the ground and some level of radioactivity in the area. Two days later, on December the 28th, the military police chief of the base, alerted by a guard patrol, called Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, who was managing the base at the time instead of the commander, to warn him that the radar had intercepted the signal of an unidentified aircraft. Determined to ascertain the origin of the phenomenon, Holt gathered about ten men and personally took command of the team. Entering the forest, they realised they had been isolated, as a strange interference blocked radio communications, and subsequently advancing in the forest, the team would have seen a strong luminosity in the area where the Penniston team had sighted the alleged UFO two nights earlier. A soldier equipped with a Geiger counter confirmed the rise in radioactivity levels, exactly as reported in the inspection of the 26th of December. Then there was a turning point. Suddenly, the men saw an extremely bright object in the shape of an ellipse, red in colour but with a darker centre, floating among the trees, about four metres above the ground, and heading east. Immediately, the soldiers walked towards the object that seemed to be moving away from them, and followed it until they reached a barbed wire fence that marked the border with a field of a local farmer. The UFO continued its trajectory, stopping in the middle of the field, beyond the barbed wire. Colonel Holt observed it well. It looks like it's made of cast steel, were his words. Suddenly, with a bright flash, the UFO split into five luminous white objects that hovered in the sky. As they advanced along the border of the farmer's property, the men kept seeing three of these luminous objects flying obliquely towards the sky, producing intermittent red, green and blue lights. Holt contacted the air defence base, who said they had not detected any radar signals of flying objects in the area. 
the men continue to observe the zigzag movement of the three luminous objects for about an hour, until Holt gave the order to return to base. Where they discovered that the photos and videos taken of the observation appeared blurry and could not be used to analyse the phenomenon. On January the 13th, 1981, Lieutenant Colonel Holt sent a report of the events to the British Ministry of Defence. Various accounts have been offered for the events at Rendlesham. First, the Orford Ness Lighthouse, which emitted a fairly intense beam of light, could be seen a few kilometres from the base. That night, a bright fireball was also observed flying over the skies of southern England, a phenomenon that astronomers attributed to the passage of a meteor. The event was resolved, thanks to a BBC report, in which an article revealed what had really happened on those two evenings. Basically, former military police officer Kevin Condé confessed in 2003 that he believed they were simple stars, but observing their movement and subsequent trans in 1993. Craig arranged meetings with like-minded people and spent whole nights with them, trying to document evidence of the existence of UFOs. Like Craig, Billy Buchanan also gave himself the personal mission of trying to explain these strange phenomena, reaching a surprising conclusion. Undoubtedly, whatever was happening in the skies of Scotland, it could not be attributed to human origin. With time and the advent of the internet, obviously the story relating to this hotspot grew dramatically, also generating a large number of conspiracy theories, among which certainly the most interesting speaks of a secret military installation, a sort of British Area 51, where they would carry out experiments on latest generation aircraft based on flying saucers recovered over the years by His Majesty's government. Many more sightings became known about through the phased release between 2008 and 2013 of Ministry of Defence UFO sighting reports by the National Archives. UK Ministry of Defence declassified documents relating to unidentified flying object activities provide an overview of the investigation and reporting of alleged sightings in the UK as they cover a large time period, with some documents dating back to the 1950s and 60s, while others extend up to 2009. Inside the documents, one can find official reports, correspondence, photographs, audio recordings and other material related to UFO sightings. These include reports from members of the public, military personnel, police and other reputable sources. The documents also reveal the Ministry of Defence's efforts to seek rational explanations for the sightings, such as atmospheric phenomena, conventional aircraft, satellites, rockets or elaborate hoaxes. However, in some cases, a definitive explanation could not be provided. The opening of the files has obviously helped to stimulate public debate on the UFO phenomenon, raising questions about the possibility of extraterrestrial life and government transparency regarding UFO investigations. Among those disclosed, there have been reported sightings of UFOs that were stationary in front of Parliament and in the vicinity of Stonehenge. The documents indicate that the UFO office also received hotline calls about alleged alien contacts, such as a man who claimed in 2008 that he had lived with an alien for some time and another individual who claimed a UFO stole his dog, car and tent while he was camping in 2007. But among the thousands of reports, some are really curious, which is why we decided to take some examples, ranging from the 50s to the early 2000s. The 14th to the 25th of September 1952. Operation Mainbrace. On September the 19th at 10.53, 
a silver disc-shaped object followed two Air Force aircraft in training. The phenomenon was observed by the military on the ground. First, the object followed the trail of a Gloucester Meteor aircraft returning to base, and later stationed itself at the rear of an ultralight RAF Topcliffe aircraft. In the long chase, the object rotated as it hovered within striking distance of the two RAF aircraft. After a few minutes, it finally headed west, at high speed. Subsequently, on the 21st of September, six RAF aircraft tracked a spherical object over the North Sea. It too then flew off at great speed, leaving the pilots with more questions than answers. On the 4th of April 1957, a large object was seen on RAF West Fraw radar near Stranra at 15,000 metres, which remained stationary for 10 minutes over the Irish Sea. It moved vertically to 21,000 metres and was also tracked by radar at Ardwell. The cigar-shaped object was described as being as large as a cargo ship and was observed making a sharp turn that was aerodynamically impossible. The M, PCs Roger Willey and Clifford Waycott were driving from Holsworthy to Hatherley along the A3072 road when they saw a bright cross-shaped object at about 15 minutes along the road, travelling at high speeds approaching 100 km per hour. Then at about 4.23 this first flying object was joined by a second. Both disappeared around 5 a.m. after being chased for 40 kilometers. April the 21st, 1991. Airline pilot Achille Zaghetti of Grosseto, Tuscany, aboard an Alitalia McDonnell Douglas MD-80 on a flight from Milan to Heathrow, saw a three meter long khaki colored object in the skies above Lid in Kent. The UFO was 300 metres from the plane and was also detected by the radar of nearby London Lid Airport. March the 31st, 1993. Several witnesses in the southwest and west of England saw a large triangular shaped UFO hurtling across the sky, leaving a trail of light. Analysis of the sightings by the Ministry of Defence concluded that the object was the re entry of a Russian rocket combined with a subsequent sighting of a police helicopter. After entering the new millennium, British singer Kim Wilde reported on the 26th of June 2009 that she saw a huge bright light behind a cloud above her garden in Hertfordshire. She described the light as brighter than the moon, but similar to moonlight. Upon further inspection, Wilde reported seeing the light move very quickly from about 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Then it moved back and forth for several minutes. Each time it moved, something moved through the air, but it was silent, absolutely silent. A second report of this UFO was later made by a colleague based in Hertfordshire, who had managed to obtain photographic evidence to support the apparent sighting. In conclusion, this documentary has offered an in-depth and engaging look into the phenomenon of UFO sightings and the declassified government files relating to the UK's Ministry of Defence. Over the course of our narration, we have explored numerous intriguing cases, credible testimonies and official documents that prompted us to ponder the possibilities of an extraterrestrial presence in our reality. Thanks to the analysis of experts, investigators and eyewitnesses, we have been able to gain a broader perspective on UFO phenomena and the British government's attempts to understand them. Opening the secret files was a significant step towards transparency. However, despite the efforts made to investigate UFOs, the documentary has shown that the ultimate truth remains elusive. Many of the sightings cannot be convincingly explained, leaving room for theory, conjecture and a sense of wonder of the mystery of the unknown. What clearly emerges is that the UFO phenomenon still deserves attention 
and further research. We must continue to explore, study and carefully analyse the sightings and available evidence to shed light on the mysteries surrounding these events. Ultimately, the documentary prompted us to ask fundamental questions about our position in the universe and the possibility of other intelligent life forms out there. Perhaps through the deepening of these investigations and the disclosure of more secret files, we will one day be able to unravel the truth behind UFO sightings and discover new and fascinating perspectives regarding our existence in the infinite cosmos.